Welcome to High Truths on Drugs and Addiction, where national experts bring you facts and answer your questions. I am your host, Dr. Oni Lev, an emergency and addiction doctor who has served at the White House and still practices on the front lines. Right here on High Truths, you will learn from experts, hear stories from the emergency department, and listen to people who have struggled from addiction. Friends, fentanyl is plaguing America. It has infected all illicit drugs, from cocaine to meth, counterfeit pills, and even marijuana. If you're around someone who may be using drugs, you should carry naloxone, the opioid reversal agent. Carrying naloxone for drugs is like carrying an EpiPen for allergies. If you need a prescription for naloxone, you should have one, no questions asked. That is why I'm offering a free prescription to anyone who needs one. Come visit me on hightruths.com to learn more about the show, submit a question, or download a free prescription for naloxone. And if you like the show, do me a favor. Give us a five-star review and subscribe. Your stars are very much appreciated and go a long way in supporting the program. Today's episode is sponsored by Families Against Fentanyl. FAF is an organization set on breaking the status quo of failed solutions and to get to the core of the supply chain of deadly fentanyl. Learn more about FAF by visiting familiesagainstfentanyl.org and sign their petition to declare illegal fentanyl a weapon of mass destruction. Hello again, High Truth listeners. Get ready to unfold blueprints for prevention. I'm your host, Dr. Ronit Lev. It is well established that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And that's according to Benjamin Franklin. But according to SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, a dollar in upstream drug prevention saves $18 in downstream cost of drug use. SAMHSA's Dollar and Cents Report on Cost-Benefit Analysis of Substance Abuse Prevention from 2008 stated that if effective prevention programs were implemented nationally, Substance use initiation would decline for 1.5 million youth across the country and be delayed for two years on average from initiation of drugs. What are blueprints for an effective youth prevention programs? Are we doing enough for our youth? And with that, let's hear our question of the day. Hi, Dr. Love and Hi Truth listeners. My name is Sarah, and I'm the Evaluation and Prevention Coordinator at the Center for Community Research, supporting our substance use disorder prevention system through evaluation and data-related support here in San Diego County. Thank you for sharing such important information and thoughtful conversations through your podcast. My question for you today is, what are the best practices for selecting effective, evidence-based drug prevention programs, and what are the best approaches for evaluating programs being implemented in the prevention field? Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for your question, and thank you for your many years in drug prevention study and evaluation. I first met you as a graduate student in a project we did together with the San Diego County Medical Society distributing pre-written naloxone prescriptions at emergency departments. Since then, you've been quite an energizer bunny in multitasking countless of projects. You are incredible. And to answer your critical question, I have an expert who evaluates prevention programs with hard science, Dr. Pamela Buckley. Dr. Buckley is a senior research associate at the Institute of Behavioral Science at the University of Colorado Boulder. Her expertise is in evidence-based decision-making for social programs and policies for youth ages 0 to 24. She has been the principal or co-principal investigator on over $5 million in grants. One of her projects is Blueprints for Healthy Youth Development. Her work is supported by the Institute of Education Sciences. To learn more about Dr. Pamela Buckley and Blueprints for Healthy Youth Development, check out the High Truth show notes. Dr. Pamela Buckley, welcome to High Truths. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to have you here. And Dr. Buckley, you are a doctor of psychology, but you don't treat patients. Rather than helping individuals change, you help populations change. So tell us about how you entered the world of drug prevention. Um, first of all, feel free to call me Pam. I'm much more comfortable with that. And second of all, I actually am an educational psychologist by training. And what that means is I am trained 
to provide the kinds of environments children need to thrive and learn, typically in a school setting. And how I got involved in this world, and I'm going to backpedal a little bit. When I think about drug prevention, I'm going to talk about prevention with a larger umbrella because individuals who struggle with substance use issues often, if you look up, you know, if you look back to many, many years ago, they're struggling with many, many issues, which is why they're turning to drugs and alcohol. So stepping back, um, I actually started working with homeless teenagers who were pregnant or parenting. And I was 22 years old and I was watching, this was many, many years ago, I was watching the Ricky Lake show. I don't know if you remember the Ricky Lake show or how many people here watching do, but it was one of the first reality shows that existed. And I remember sitting, I was about 22 myself, and I'm sitting around the room with 15, 16 year olds and their parents, and they're watching this television screen and they're seeing people throw chairs at each other and yell and it all what was dysfunctional in terms of communication. And I remember turning to these individuals and saying, this is not healthy communication. This is not how families function. And thinking like there was a disconnect with the folks I was working with and an aha, I really want to see this is problematic. And um, I was really concerned about the reality the folks I was working with saw. I then moved on and to education and higher education and started to study educational psychology, thinking education is the key to prevention, providing folks with skills so that they have opportunities. And in working within the school settings, I was working with wonderful families and children who simply had not been given the opportunities to thrive. And I remember coming to the school leaders with, as a, as a graduate student with recommendations about how to help individuals learn and the skills they needed and the resources they needed. And simply the reason why we couldn't provide some of those services is because of a funding issue. We don't lack the, we, we lack the funding to implement these procedures. And I remember being really frustrated. I was about 75% through my doctoral training. And I remember turning to my academic advisor and I said, I'm really frustrated. The system is not working. We have solutions. I've seen these working with children. I've read the literature. Why can't we implement? It's a funding mechanism, X, Y, Z, lots of excuses. And my advisor said, if this is something that you want to tackle, you really need to think about beyond individual clinical opportunities to, to work with youth. Think about a more systems level approach. And I literally at that point in time, finished the courses I was taking that semester and completely did a 180. And I went 100% into research and statistics and took on another year's worth of academic um, criteria and um, credits I had to meet because I decided I wanna get involved in preventing problems in the first place, using education as a tool, but that, to me was a systems approach. And that's where research design and statistics got into play. My dissertation was actually, again, this is, I'm dating myself decades ago. It was the tobacco settlements um, in the early, gosh, 2000s. And Colorado, where I was doing my training was implementing a policy statewide. And I actually conducted an evaluation of a policy that was being implemented in the schools using these tobacco settlements. And so then I also got involved in thinking about policy solutions to, to thinking on a large level, how these funds should be used wisely in terms of investing these dollars. And since then I've spent the last 25 years wearing two hats. One is more from a methodologist and conducting rigorous studies, trials of interventions, developed for youth that we want to test out and see if these interventions work. And if so, they can be scaled up on a systems level. Or the other hat I wear is applying that knowledge towards other people's studies and vetting that study and seeing if you can trust those causal implications coming out of those individual research studies. So that's really my story of how I got involved in prevention, but it was started working individually with one-on-one -on -one and seeing what wasn't working, and then thinking about where I could be most effective and more, most useful in terms of um, sharing my knowledge, my passions, and my skills. And you're doing just that and, and helping on a population uh, basis. It's interesting how in your youth, one statement someone says to you can really switch um, your path.
Well, I, and the I other thing I would say to that too is in addition to how one person can influence you, I've also learned that I would have never predicted when I think about all the training I've had academically, it's not like one step led to the next. I kept pursuing my passions and then found the academic training I needed to put it all into place. But even though I work at a university and I work in an academic setting, I really pride myself in being a translator of knowledge. And I want to take that scientific evidence and I want to put it into the hand of users so that they are then armed with the knowledge they need to make good choices when it comes to investing in what we're going to talk about today is prevention. So let's start with that. Since you want to translate things, what does prevention mean? What's substance use prevention? People say law enforcement does prevention and treatment is prevention, harm reduction is prevention. What is healthy prevention for youth? I'm going to ask folks to think about when we talk about prevention, and again, you, you, you pose the question around substance use, and I'm going to ask us to think broader. And substance use is endemic of a problem that's related to deficits of skills, and it's learning how to build those skills so that we don't turn to drugs and alcohol as a solution when we're challenged with life. And this deficit of skills, actually, these skills are developed. If we think about prevention, they start really young. They start when we're born into this world. They start about they start within the environments we're born into and the opportunities that we're given. And so when we think about healthy youth development, we think about what does it look like within a family setting to have access to skills, to learn how to problem solve, to learn how to communicate? What does it look like to have access to schools, to have teachers teaching curricula that that challenge us, that, that help us develop our academic skills so that we can achieve and thrive and, and show us opportunities. What does it mean to live in a community that has access to grocery stores with healthy food and um, having access to parks? Um, and so what I just described are what we call protective factors. And as we're vulnerable as youth and we are developing throughout life, we are identifying within our environment and from that we're developing skills. And prevention is a matter of building those protective environments, those protective skills as we navigate our life and go older and older and learn skills ourselves and into adulthood. Now I'm gonna contrast that with risk factors. So when we're young and we're vulnerable, if we don't have the kind of guidance we need or the opportunities we need, we're going to then likely, because we don't have the skills, we might go down a problematic path. And the risk factors that we're trying to reduce have to do with opportunity. They have to do with modeling. They have to do with um, learning how to resolve conflict, learning how to communicate your needs, learning how to regulate your emotions. Um, and they also have to do with thinking about learning how to challenge yourself academically so that you feel successful in school. So we want to reduce those risk factors that keep us from success and we want to build those protective factors. And and we and depending developmentally where we are, there are different strategies that are shown to be effective depending on the age of the youth. Well, I'm glad you say that it's effective because that's my next question to you is does prevention work? Some people say, you know, all kids are going to use drugs. Just teach them how to use safely. Is that true? Can we really prevent lifetime use? And and now it's, you know, one pill can kill, right? One use can right. kill you. Um, is is it possible? The tricky part about prevention is how do you measure something that doesn't happen, right? We can measure treatment because the problem exists. Prevention is an investment. And it's an investment in, in preventing something from happening. So does prevention work? Well, what we do know, we have tons of studies, tons of science showing us that there are strategies that have been successful when we think about what we're going to call an upstream approach to prevention. So having developmentally appropriate strategies that can be implemented, whether it's in the home setting, whether it's in a school setting, whether it's in a community setting, we have tons of research showing that certain strategies exist that build those protective factors. And when implemented with fidelity and when in implemented um, over time and with continued investment in prevention, we certainly do see 
a trajectory in terms of different, different patterns folks take downstream in terms of the choices they make and more uh, successful youth outcomes, life outcomes. So looking at these outcomes, the science of prevention work, what what can actually decrease uh, in use by using these programs? For example, the RAND Corporation showed that school-based prevention programs can decrease um, use, total use in kids, and also delay onset of a- initiation of kids. So those were two measurements. Is that is that the kind of science that you're looking at and measuring? So I can give you a more um, whittled down example. So I actually just completed a study where we looked at I'm going to use the term randomized controlled trial, which is considered the gold standard about how to, in terms of a design used to evaluate these different interventions. And I was looking across 10 years time of randomized controlled trials, studying interventions implemented with youth. And across that 10 year span, we found it was 900 randomized control trials. We were looking at more than 70% of that uh, of those programs were taking place in school settings. So certainly schools are an important, um, important to target in terms of thinking about how to reach youth and help youth. And there have been several interventions designed that are meant to be implemented in schools and that also have been shown if implemented in a school setting with this age group and you teach these certain skills, then yes, we can follow those and these skills all around let's say a secondary setting and you've got teachers implementing this in a school setting and it's a it's an it's an intervention that teaches problem solving and and um, it teaches um, peer pressure how to handle peer pressure and it teaches how to manage your emotions and they give you problem situations related to drugs and alcohol and how would you handle this given the strategies put together within these individual interventions we have seen youth followed over time and we're seeing decreases when you think about self-reports in terms of attitudes towards substance use, in terms of use of, of, of substances within the 30, last 30 days, et cetera. We have actually do have studies showing with individual interventions, youth being tracked over time and seeing that these effects are being sustained. So yes, we do have solutions that have been tested rigorously, rigorously and have shown long-term sustained impact in a high-risk population in terms of showing reduced outcomes related to substance substance use. I could get into what the names of those strategies are. I can talk about how to find that information, but it is important to know that there are interventions like this that do exist. That's great. And, you know, it makes me sad because I'm thinking about what's happening in California. They got rid of school-based prevention, and at the same time, they're increasing um, drug use by legalizing marijuana and recreational and, 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 you know, in a way, even promoting drug use while eliminating the front end prevention upstream approaches. Um, And I can tell you as an educational psychologist, having worked in the schools, I mean, teachers are taxed and they're working hard to teach kids how to read, write, and do arithmetic. That's what they were trained to do. And schools are being asked to do more and more and more, but that's where youth are. And it's important that we reach them and that we show schools and and leaders strategies that are shown to be effective. And so it's worth the time invested in teaching these types of programs. It's worth it in terms of lives saved, but also uh, financially, right? The economics of it are worth it also. Absolutely. So Sarah Salvin is... um, works in prevention. She's got a, a master's in, in in working in this field. And I work with her at the Center of Community Research. She has a question to you. And she does a lot of evaluation of programs herself. And she's asking, what is the best method to evaluate drug prevention programs? And how do you select which prevention program to implement, implement and, and how do you evaluate them? Um, I mentioned that I wear two hats. One of my hats is conducting rigorous trials of interventions, drug use, drug prevention trials being one example of of studies I'll conduct. The other is looking at the science out there and other people's studies and being able to scrutinize. And I can tell you when it comes to, quote, what works and what's the best method, we need to think about evidence as a continuum. It takes time to build evidence. Ideas are generated. They're tested out over time. Um, And then with time and with feedback and with revisions to materials and in terms of continued testing, 
my expertise falls on the higher end of evidence. And that's when we wanna do what we call make causal inferences. And by causal inferences, that is simply whittled down to, we wanna know if something quote works. We wanna know if this drug intervention works. And the methods, there are certain methods that are implemented in terms of testing out the data. A randomized control trial is the gold standard. And that's the world I live in, in terms of scrutinizing studies or running those studies. But you can't conduct a randomized control trial without years of building the evidence in terms of testing out these ideas. And when it gets to the point of a randomized control trial, they're tricky to impl implement in the real world, not all Interventions can be implemented with a randomized control trial, but we want to know those who had the program versus those that didn't. What does that look like over time? And so that really is considered the gold standard in terms of understanding if something, quote, works. So um, you are the principal investigator for Blueprints. Let's talk about Blueprints for a little bit. Blueprints for Healthy Youth Developments. What, what are these blueprints? We know blueprints are for building homes um, and construction. What are blueprints for healthy youth? Right. I'm, I'm so glad you gave that analogy. So when we think about what does it take to become a healthy, functioning adult, we all know there's no blueprint. We don't know, we, but we do know that there are methods that have been shown to be effective. We want guidance in terms of figuring out what's the best path forward in terms of healthy youth development. So I run in, in half my time, the, the second hat I wear around vetting other people's studies is a registry. We are an online free resource and we run a website. And this website is very much, I give the analogy of a consumer reports guide. So I don't know anything about refrigerators. I don't know what makes for a good refrigerator. I don't want to know that. That's not something I care about, but I do care if I'm gonna spend a lot of money on a refrigerator, I wanna know it works. And I wanna find a place I can trust to do the work for me. So I turn to the consumer reports guide whenever I wanna make a big investment to buy some sort of good or purchase. We at Blueprints for Healthy Youth Development operate with the same concept, but we're not looking at refrigerators. We're not looking at purchasing products we're looking at behavioral interventions. And we, it, we have the scientific knowledge and a scientific vetting process for being able to look at different randomized control trials that have been conducted on strategies or programs that have been developed for youth and that are the studies are saying are shown to be effective. And what we do is we look under the hood of those studies and we look at the science behind it and we look at the statements those studies are saying, and we see if the two can map together. And if they do, we spend a lot of time then gathering information about that particular intervention in terms of where it's been implemented, who it's been tested upon, the types of populations, what it costs, et cetera, what it takes to implement. And we put that information on our website and we disseminate that information. And we do Efforts like I am here today talking about this. We want to get this knowledge out to folks because there are many people faced with the decision whether you work at an agency, a state agency, and you're being told, hey, we've got this challenge with youth that we're wanting to tackle and what's your solution? Or maybe you've got a, you run a nonprofit organization and you are really focused on substance use prevention, but your funder is saying, how do you know that we should invest in your program? How do you know it works? We want folks to turn to us to get ideas because we vetted that science and that's our expertise. We want folks to know this work is being done. You don't have to figure it out. You can trust us. And so that's the role we serve at Blueprints. We spend a lot of time showing folks how to navigate the registry. We're on social media. We're doing these podcasts because we want folks to come to us with their questions. And if you have a question, and you're not able to find that information on our registry, you can contact us and you can send us whatever your question is, or if you have a study and you, you say, hey, this study is saying that this works in preventing substance use with 15 year olds, send it to us and we'll look at it and we'll tell you if you can trust what that author is saying. And it's and I do wanna be clear, we're not in the business of a gotcha. We're not in the business of saying researchers aren't ethical at all. We're in the business of saying, this is really complicated information and we have no bias. 
We have, we have no conflicts of interest. We have no skin in the game other than to genuinely say, here's what the science says. So I, I like your analogy with refrigerators, right? So if I'm buying a refrigerator, maybe I care about the color or how big it is or how cold the freezer gets, right? So for prevention programs, community members may want to know how to make children thrive. And policymakers want to know um, they don't want to waste your taxpayer dollars. But you, as a principal investigator, you are reach, uh, your research focus is on what? And you kind of mentioned that, right? Uh, looking at the science and randomized control science and people that could count on it. But what's when you look at a study, what do you focus on? Um, first of all, we want to know if a study is saying something works, we want to know what that design was that was being implemented. We want to know, are you comparing results from the, your program to those who didn't receive your program? So what we call that is a treatment group versus a control group. We want to know if there's any kind of comparison there. We also want to know how that comparison was derived. Is it through randomization, which is the gold standard? Was there some other mechanism, maybe a matched way of statistically comparing? So that's another thing that we're looking at. And then there's a whole science around what the statistics and, and how those statistics have been implemented and how those results were interpreted. But backing up, even before we get into the design and the statistics, we wanna know what is your theory here? Why is it that you think this particular activity will be tied to a certain outcome? What does the literature say? What is your theory there? And then we want to know how those activities match that theory. Then we see within the study how individuals who receive those activities linked to your theory match up against those who have what we would typically call business as usual, as if that program didn't exist. And we're looking at those comparisons over time. We're also looking at what happens from not just when the program ends, but what about six months later or a year later? or two years later. And if you see that those who had this program compared to those who didn't are doing better, are they still doing better a year later? And there's all these complexities around how to handle what I'm, I'm not gonna get into baseline equivalence or differential attrition is, but these are all empirical standards that we're following. And these empirical standards have been developed and have been disseminated by scientists, many involved with the Society of Prevention Research. These are scholars in the field of prevention science and preventive intervention. So these are not standards we made up. These are standards we're adopting based on what the experts say. And then we're implementing them through a very, very, very rigorous process that involves multiple brains, multiple sets of eyes with folks, again, with no conflicts of interest, we have no skin in the game, we have no money to make off this, but we then have differing content expertise, but we all have similarities around methodological and statistical expertise. But then importantly, we want to be able to explain what this study is saying, not just to the academic world, which is certainly very important, and that's one audience we speak to, but we want to know for those who want to implement this in community, what exactly is this study saying? So we'll translate it in a way that's useful for folks who want to potentially implement that strategy in their community or in their school. It's interesting. So much scrutiny is put on prevention programs. I just wish there was that much scrutiny placed on laws that are passed or even treatments that are, uh, you know, recommended. It doesn't seem like the rest of the world has as much scrutiny on it as we do in prevention programs. And, and I would say, I think part of that falls on folks like me too, to get the message out. Because if we're hearing folks say that prevention doesn't work, then that means we need to do a better job getting out there and saying, yeah, it does. And here are some individual examples and here's the incredibly big process they've gotten to gone through to come to that conclusion. And how do we get that message out? And who are all the audiences? So we want to get the message out to the policymakers. We want to get the message out to the to the practitioners, those who are implementing these programs, but also to communities and families and individuals, and let them know the benefits of these types of strategies. So when you think about school, there are different types of preventions, like you mentioned. But if you talk about school-based preventions. Um, people just come right away and say, oh, well, the D.A.R.E. program didn't work. And, you know, that's why prevention doesn't work. Can you explain? I think most people heard of the D.A.R.E. program, but they don't even know what it is. 
what was the program, why didn't it work, and um, does that mean all prevention doesn't work? Well, I, I, I'm not an expert in DARE. I'm an expert more in methodology. Um, I do know that um, there are different versions of DARE out there too with different names in different countries. And I know there's a lot of messiness in terms of understanding what these findings mean. Um, my understanding of the original DARE, which again is not my area of expertise, but had to do with law enforcement officers coming in and talking to schools about the dangers of doing drugs. If I'm going to, I don't know if I'm fair in saying, making this parallel to, you know, uh, Nancy Reagan, her her just say no. Really, it really takes, um, these are complicated systems we're working in and complicated behavior. And so when we think about why didn't it work? Well, there are multiple strategies that involve multiple skill sets from different experts coming in that have been shown to be effective in terms of drug prevention. But these strategies just haven't been come, they haven't come to the forefront. And so um, DARE just is really well known. And the idea that DARE, the one, the version of DARE that we all seem to hold on to is not working, somehow represents prevention is something that is not um, indicative of what it means for prevention to quote, work or not work. There are also many other strategies that either don't work or we don't know if they don't work. I think it's more common to say, it's not that something doesn't work, it's just that we don't know if it works because it hasn't been, there were problems with the study design or what the study design wasn't rigorous enough. And so we need more information. Um, and so I think we know more about whether things, we're not sure if they work, but we do know that there are individual strategies that are effective and we need to get past the whole deer discussion and we need to then be focusing on what resources exist that do lend us to point us to strategies that are effective. How do I get a hold of those resources and how do I interpret that information so that it's useful to me? And that's really what we're trying to do here at Blueprints for Healthy Youth Development. Interesting. And when you look at different programs, I know that we talked before and I've learned from you. Um, different programs can target different audiences. There are programs that are universal. I think that means helping all the population versus very selective, like when you were 22 years old, talking to a homeless um, uh, teen women right. with a family, right? That's very selective. Can you explain that and maybe even give us some examples? Yeah. I, and, and again, I don't want to get too bogged down in the, the details of um, terminology, um, but th theoretically or just the gist. A universal strategy is one that's targeting all populations. And there are drug interventions and prevention programs that target all populations. And the idea is we're gonna, we're gonna implement this school-wide, for example, and we're gonna give all youth these kinds of skills around, around how to build resiliency and how to say no. And, and it's much more complicated than I'm saying right now in terms of what these strategies look Interesting like. Interesting you say how to say no, because just a few sentences ago, we said, Nancy Reagan, just say no, right. that's not good. That's why I'm, I, I'm really, really simplifying this, but it has to do with- But, but that's why I think we diss that whole program. Yeah. When we see something's bad, we automatically say, okay, dare's bad all drug prevention programs are right. bad or having a law enforcement come talk to the school. Okay. We don't want any law enforcement officer right. in the school or just say, no, it's like, well, we throw out the baby with the bathwater right. when there's actually still good principles exactly. in there. Yeah. Right. Right. So universal approach is targeting the whole school with whatever that type of intervention is. And then Selective would be maybe within that school, you've got certain subpopulations that are starting to show risk behaviors that would indicate they could be going down a, a, a trajectory of, of, of ex, um, experimenting at higher levels than teens typically do around drugs and alcohol. So we need to intervene. And it could be whatever that universal approach was, we're going to then add on additional skill building for this selective group. And then the indicative group are those it's another subgroup within that subgroup that are actually demonstrating risky behaviors. And they're gonna take another approach that's even more layered in terms of what that intervention would look like because they're actually starting to exhibit those behaviors. So that's, and you can have strategies that involve all three, universal, indicated, or selective. You could have one that does universal and selective, 
or you can just do a universal. It really depends on what the challenges that you're faced with and the community or environment that you're working within. So at Blueprints for Healthy Youth Development, the registry that I run, what we have is think about it, it's like a menu. And I don't know if this is a fair analogy, but it's like going to a restaurant and you're looking at the menu and you're just like, okay, this is what I need or I want. So let's let's take it as an example. Let, let's run a, a case, okay? I'm sitting in San Diego. Our um, um, city council said our schools are gonna have a education in schools on fentanyl. Okay, now I go to your blueprints and decide, okay, we were told, we were mandated, we have to do this program. How do I find the right evidence-based program? Right, so so that's really the menu. Then at the restaurant, um, I'm glad you gave you asked for that specific example. So you've got a solution or, or you've got a problem that you're looking to tackle mm -hmm. and it has to do with fentanyl. So I'm going to put it under our own umbrella. We have different criteria you can search upon within our registry. And so we have outcomes you can search by. And we have outcomes based on what we'll call alcohol, opioid. They're not, we have alcohol, we have illicit drugs, we have marijuana cannabis, we have nicotine. So we, it might not be falling specifically within fentanyl, but you can see the umbrella terms that we use in terms of outcomes. That's one way to search. You can also search for interventions based on the type of prevention strategy. If you're looking for a universal and indicated or a selective. So think about just ticking off a box with the search criteria you have. And then it, it could be also setting. It could be I'm working within a school setting or I'm working within a community setting. So you put in your search criteria and then you get an inventory of results that have met our scientific standards. And within that list, you can actually export it. You can email it. You can look at it yourself and you'll have a plethora of information around what those individual strategies look like but because it targeted those outcomes that you searched on, you know that it will, it's been designed and it's been tested and shown to impact those particular outcomes. So let's say I went to Blueprint, I did my little search, I put in fentanyl or opioid and school-based, universal, maybe some selective. Now I'm going to have a few programs. Let's say I chose one of them. Now what? Now what do I do? You see your list and you see how it matches up with what your needs are. And there are different ways to approach it at this point. Can I can I then implement this program? Is there a saying, okay, okay, here, this is the program. These are the people that you go to. to exactly. To so, so thank you for clarifying that question. So we spend a lot of time collecting information about what it takes to implement those individual strategies. So it could be like, what is the cost? Who do I go to to get the training? Um, some of these are actually online, open source. So it, we, we provide all the information we can gather and they will not be listed on our registry if you don't have any information about how to implement with Fidelity. Because there's no point in saying, because this does happen where folks, academics or individuals test out these strategies and it's part of their research agenda, but it's not necessarily meant to be scaled up within communities. So even if it does meet our scientific evidence criteria, we have another whole standard that we're looking at, what we call dissemination readiness. How possible is it for this intervention to get in the hands of users? Do they have the information they need to be able to implement it and adopt it with fidelity? So for example, I would go and I'll choose this program. Um, you know, Let's say, I'm just gonna call it fentanyl program. For, for okay. schools. And now I, um, the website will tell me, this is where you go for information. This is the, the uh, teachers need to be educated or a school nurse need to be educated. And here's the program that you do for, for kids. Um, exactly. And this is the curriculum or? Exactly. It depends on the strategy, but exactly. Every, so we have a whole fact sheet. And on that fact sheet, we have the description. We have the contact information. We have a, a, a summary of the activities. We have a summary of all the studies we've reviewed. We have a place that's up front that just gets at the results. We have a place at the back that gets into the nitty gritty of the study for the research people who want to understand that. Mm -hmm. And then we get into all the information around costs, training, human resources. We even, where available, have information on return on investment. So for every dollar you spend, in this intervention, it's been shown to reduce problem behavior, and it's going to be a savings to taxpayers by X, Y, Z. Wow, that's kind of cool. So let's talk about the the programs that get certified. You say you certify these programs, and there you. I learned from you that there's different levels of certification. Um, 
can you tell us you've reviewed how many, how hard is it to get certified? Well, it's how hard it's, it's, um, there definitely is a process and in many, we do have a peer review process. There is a whole process we go through where we are scanning the literature ourselves or folks are sending us reports. We read these reports. We see if they meet our criteria around, do they, are these strategies intended for youth zero to 25 age in age? And are they prevention strategies? Meaning are they designed to build those protective factors and reduce those risk factors to produce positive behavioral outcomes? We do not look at medical treatments. We do not look at pharmacology treatments. We are focused on prevention. So if it meets those criteria and the study has those who receive the program versus those who don't, so we'll call that a treatment versus a control group, we bring it through a vetting process, internal, external review, and then we look at the results. And for those that meet our standards, we look at two things. We're looking at, do those results work in favor of those who had the program and the program's over? And how many studies suggest that, those results? So if it's one well-done study, that's a really promising result. And this is a strategy worth considering. That's one of our rating criteria called promising. Really, though, we're thinking about systems levels how to improve results at scale, whether that's at a school district level, whether that's at a city level, a state level, et cetera. So then we also then are looking to see, okay, are there results in favor of the program at when the program's over and are they sustained over time? And if so, do, are they sustained for at least a year's time? And not only are they sustained, but is there replication? Is there another well-done study suggesting the same? That's where it meets what we call a model status. And that's where we're saying, hey, these are the programs you should really be considering for scale. And then the model plus one more level, we just are looking to see those who, who studied the program, are they completely independent of those who developed the program? But it's really those model, model plus that we're looking to see that have met our standards and also have the information folks need to implement those strategies in their community. So that's a real quick, nutsh in a nutshell, what it takes to make it through our process. And, and how many programs are on Blueprints? So we've looked at over 1,500 programs. We've been around since 1996. And of those 1,500 programs, 106 have met not just our scientific standards, but our dissemination standards. And of those 106, I want to say it's 18 actually are at that model, model plus level, ready for scale. So I want our audience to hear that. You know, we have one program, DARE, that people have controversy whether it worked or didn't work or what part didn't work. But there's 106 well-vetted, and we just heard a scientist talk about <laughs> the scrutiny, but there's 106 well-established programs that can be implemented to scale to youth across the country. And um, sadly, I don't think we're doing this enough. Well, and that's why I'm here. Yes. How do we get the word out? We get the we, word out. I write academic papers, but they, and it's important to influence the field. No, we need to like, but we need to get the word it out, out there. Right, or something. Exactly. We, and the other thing too is, <laughs> yeah, um, we, we want to know what, what this looks like in your community, what your needs are and how we can, how we can connect the dots. Yeah. In terms of providing these resources. And it's up to us as scientists and prevention scientists to be promoting the idea that per, A, prevention exists and B, prevention works and C, here's the individual strategies that have been shown to work. So I um, I think I understand that, that what you look at and publicize is well-vetted, evidence-based programs that can be put to scale and primary kind of prevention in youth. And um, ideas such as uh, the law we passed in California that I'm very proud of, of including fentanyl in a drug tests, which I think will have a wide implication. You know, that's more medical. That's not things that you're looking at. Or I was thinking when I think about the, the scrutiny that you put into prevention programs, is that f scrutiny there for safe consumption sites? That's not something that you're really looking at. And you explained that you do behavior evaluation, not medical or not 
drug policy. I wish we had that kind of scrutiny for drug policy. But what about individuals? And there are a lot of individuals across the country who are doing prevention programs. And I've featured several of them on this podcast, Rocky Heron in episode number 110, and Laura Stack and Johnny Ambassadors in episode 75. And there's many individuals who do, I think they're doing great work, um, but it may not meet the level of that uh, is required at blueprints to, you know, implement worldwide. Are there, are there something that these individuals who are doing prevention, not at scale, but just locally can learn from you? Um, or does it mean that, oh, well, you know, Rocky's program is not on blueprints because he's a solo act that reaches school. Then, you know, th that doesn't meet your uh, scrutiny. So, I mean, I guess I'm trying to say if, if it doesn't meet a blueprints criteria doesn't mean that it's not valid. It's just not maybe scalable. Well, I mean, I, I, I don't know if I, let me see if I can unpack your question. Okay. I want to emphasize that evidence is a continuum. I mentioned that at the beginning of this conversation and those individual strategies on the blueprints website, it took time to develop those ideas. And so those who are in the field doing work, building evidence, it could be that what they're working on, there is no good evidence for that particular strategy and they're building it. I would still encourage those, those folks to build the evidence, test out your ideas, do a pre and post test, see if you're getting results in, in, in with, with valid, reliable measures, see if you're getting results in the way that you expect those results to go. And then compare it, collect information on more people, those who have your program who, versus those who don't. If you don't have the skills to do it, fundraise and hire people to collect the data and build the evidence. And it's not to say that these strategies that folks are doing are not scalable. It's to say that they're not far along enough the, uh, along the evidence continuum to be able to come to those conclusions. So that's one, I hope, I don't know if I'm fully answering the question, but I, I would encourage I think that that's and then, helpful. And then the other thing I'm starting to interrupt you that I think is important is it's not to say that one program gets developed, it meets our model status program and it's said and done. We work in diverse communities. We have challenging needs. The science evolves over time. Our understanding of human behavior evolves over time. Our understanding of statistics and research design improves over time. So it's not to say that if you're working within a community and what you see on the Blueprints Registry that has been vetted by us doesn't fit your need there, it's not to say you can't take some version of what's there, adapt it for your needs and then bring in the expertise, whether it's you or someone else, to then build the evidence to see how this version works. But it's really important to think about it takes time and effort and money to test out these programs, but we do not want to be implementing strategies that we don't know if they work. That is not a good use of funds. And we also don't want to implement strategies that we can't prove are not doing harm. So, so I like what you're having to say, and because it doesn't prevent new ideas. So what's in the blueprints is established ideas. But let's say I have a new idea. I want to bring therapy dogs to school that are also drug-sniffing dogs. Um, and I want to see if that's a deterrent of having overdoses in schools that we're seeing today. Um, so you're saying don't just because that idea is not in the blueprints doesn't mean don't do it, but you are saying measure it. Um, and, and determine if theory. this is what's and that think about your theory why yeah. are you saying bringing dogs to schools i don't remember exactly your example theoretically why has this been shown to why do you think it will work what does the literature say and when you look at established well-vetted programs some of which are promising some of which have been shown to prove to work at scale what is the theory behind those in, individual strategies and how might that theory match up to what I'm thinking about. So, so really think about what's been tested, what information is out there, and rather than have to look, and I'm not saying don't look to the literature, but I'm also saying if you're not a researcher, if that's not your expertise, just know that we have those of us out there spending a lot of time scrutinizing this information and translating it for you if that's not your skill set. And we want this information used. So can I 
can I reach you? Can I reach you and say, hey, I have my uh, therapy dog sn drug yeah. sniffing idea. What do you think? And you can tell me. Yeah, I'm so glad you asked. So if folks want to hop on our registry, you could Google Blueprints for Healthy Youth Development. The URL I want to say is at www.blueprintsorg. Blueprints programs. I should know our, our URL. Anyway, it'll be on the show notes. It'll be awesome. on the show notes. Awesome. There is a place on our registry. It says nominate an intervention. You click on that and it tells you the steps you need to do to present your idea, to show your study, how to email that in, what the timeline looks like. We also have at the header and footer of our website, a, a, an email address you can use to contact us to ask your questions. And we are on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. We have a quarterly newsletter. We have a, a news chain on our website that talks all the different talks we've done, all the different groups that we've been communicating with. So we have a lot of information. I really, really hope some of you will take the time to hop on our registry and see how it might answer some of your questions, or if it's not, what you need to do to get those questions answered. That's awesome. I, I hope you your uh, email blows up with a lot of questions because there's definitely a lot of prevention work happening today all over the country. Um, and you just want to make sure it's evidence-based. And even if it's a new idea, a new concept that you show that it's um, uh, getting the results that are they're intended to. to and the do. other thing that um, we haven't really touched on is states are now going in the direction of requiring evidence in order for state dollars to be invested in different strategies. And so we're spending a lot of time at Blueprints getting involved with conversations with state legislators and with uh, budget analysts, folks who work within the state are trying to implement these policies to say, hey, or, or people putting in the budget requests, we exist. Come see our website. Let us, if you need to tag evidence to your request, just know that we have done a lot of this work. So we're trying to get the word out on many levels. That's awesome. So uh, in conclusion here, uh, let me ask you, are we doing enough as a nation to prevention? You're looking at the evidence, but you're also seeing what, what's happening, what's not happening. Are we are we doing enough? Do we need to do more? Do we need to do things better? What's your recommendation? I absolutely believe in investments in prevention. There's a lot of talk about these opioid settlements. And the if we were to do, I couldn't give you the exact percentage, the percentage going towards prevention versus the, the percentage going towards intervention and treatment. We really need to think about both. And it's not a matter of one or the other, it's both. But we also need to know that prevention works and we need to be investing in it as well. And that the, the time it takes to invest in these preventive strategies, they are have been shown to be effective, but it does take time and it is an investment and there is no short-term solution. So I would say absolutely, if you're in a position to make these decisions around funding, think about prevention as you think about intervention. Both are very important. Upstream and downstream solutions. Absolutely. I want to say thank you to Sarah Saban. She had a great question that kind of framed our episode today, and she does amazing work for San Diego County. Sarah, this is my opportunity to tell the whole world how much I appreciate you. And thank you, Dr. Pam Buckley. I know you said, said Pam, <laughs> uh, but thank you, Pam, for sharing with us Blueprint Solutions for Youth and making an emphasis on how prevention does work. And there are at least 106 different programs out there that have shown long-term implementation on scale that are available and even new programs that people have in mind um, to think about Blueprints and go to their website and use those resources that are free to any community in America. Thank you. Thank you for listening to High Truths on Drugs and Addiction, where national experts bring you facts and answer your questions. This week's episode would not be possible without the generous support from our sponsor. A sincere and warm thank you to FAF, Families Against Fentanyl. Visit familiesagainstfentanyl.org and sign the petition to declare illegal fentanyl a weapon of mass destruction. Make drug dealers think twice and three times before peddling killer drugs. Our producer is Dave Rivas from Davey Boy Productions. I am your host, Dr. Oni Lev. We hope we brought your day a little bit more high truths.